all of your devices. Is that still awkward? Yes, yeah. it is. Hmm. Now does it echo? Are you the same um, account on them? I think it is, yes. So if you're able to do a different account, it will prevent the echo. I think. Sure. I only have one account, so I'll just use this. Okay. Headphones can also help too, if that's an option. Sure. I was just going to use the other uh, the other screen as a monitor, but uh, that works. And I'll be here so I can monitor the group chat if people are typing in questions and that I can interrupt you. Sure. Awesome. We got about one minute left. Majority class, by the way. You did a fine job. Hmm? I enjoyed your class, by the way. You did a fine job. Oh, thank you. All the scene finishes. I like scene finishes. All right, it is now one o'clock. So I'm going to go ahead and um, figure out the best way. I'm going to start the recording and then screen share my screen so it shares your slide. And then I will um, unscreen share and you can begin the lesson. The recording is started. Screen share. Doo -doo -doo, share. And then, shoot, this is in the way. No, my Google. Okay, excuse me. There we go. Now I can do it. Learning curve. All right, now I'm screen sharing. Doo -doo -doo. This is Lelo and all its details by in Fuegos. It will last for one hour. If we go over the hour allotment, you are welcome to retire to the post-class discussions channel on the Discord. Um, we have both a text and a voice channel for needing. And Fuegos, go ahead and take it away. All right, very good. Well, I'm happy to teach today a little bit about uh, leather finishing and leather, uh, leather care and that. Actually, that's what I want to start out with is a little bit of care for your leather goods. Um, if you wear leather armor or have other leather goods around, um, it's important to take care of it. It'll last for an awful long time if you take care of it. If you abuse it and don't take care of it, it'll last for a few seasons and then, then be garbage and you'll be buying it again. Uh, but it's expensive enough that you should should take good care of it. Um, as an example of that, I've got actually uh, just a, uh, a piece of armor that has been used for a long time. I want to say uh, I've been told it's the this guy's the third owner of it, third or fourth owner of it, and it's a, a great uh, piece of armor. Um, has has really good wear on it and everything else, uh, but it hasn't been cared for as well um, as it probably should have. And so if you see here in the shoulders, um, there it's starting to fray and come apart, almost like it's uh, layers of fabric or layers of cells and things uh, there. So it's, uh, it comes apart in some of these places. Some of that has to do with the original finish uh, that we're gonna talk about. Some of it has to do with just maintenance of the leather. Just like if you have metal leather or metal uh, armor, you've gotta maintain it, you've gotta oil it and clean it. If you've got metal mail, you've gotta oil it and clean it and uh, keep things from happening to it. this. You need to make sure you dry it properly when you're finished having it all be sweaty and, and everything else. You've got to clean it 
and uh, make sure that it's uh, that it's kept properly uh, there. And it doesn't cost very much. It doesn't uh, take very much um, to keep things like this from happening. So if you uh, see uh, closely, there's just a, a lot of fraying and dry uh, that's in there, and that'll continue to move into the leather until the leather just really starts falling apart. And if you get into rivets and to get into other things like that, it will it will come to pieces. Uh, your straps as well uh, get dried out and they'll break, especially in the parts where it's thinner, where you've got a, a hole. Um, you know, you've got uh, an opportunity for it to break and just get dry and brittle uh, there as you go. And so maintaining that uh, can be really pretty easy um, there. And that, that uh, comes into getting it dry uh, the first time so that uh, as you uh, take it off and, and put it away for the week or whatever or the week or the month or however long it is uh, that you get it dry, uh, dried out and then um, probably taken care of. If you got it dirty, um, if it gets some uh, some human buildup on it, um, other things like that, uh, you can use something like a saddle soap. Um, saddle soap's great. You can buy it in any tech shop, any place where they sell uh, saddles and things like that. Um, it's just a soap that is a leave-on type soap. You clean and polish uh, kind of all together. And you can uh, polish things up really pretty well, keep it looking nice. You think about the people who use leather and abuse the leather the most, it's definitely uh, horse uh, materials. So saddles and tack and other things that way uh, get beat up on really pretty, pretty regularly. And that's what they use to polish and clean that leather and keep it up. It's got a little bit of oil in it, uh, so it, it keeps that. So if you ever get dirty, uh, there, it's a good idea to uh, get that clean and keep it clean uh, for the beginning. Uh, to keep things uh, nice and soft as well, uh, you can use Neat's Foot Oil uh, there that you can uh, pick up. Uh, a bottle like this will last you for a long time um, if, you're, if you only have like one or two pieces of armor uh, that you're maintaining and other things. Your straps, things like that, just uh, take a rag, put it on a rag or a sponge, uh, keep them clean and and get that uh, get that oil into that uh, material and it'll stay nice and flexible um, and a lot happier. Um, I use the needs foot oil in my process as well. It gets the leather soft, it helps it take dye really well uh, and comes comes together uh, really, really very well. But we're gonna look at this on a little smaller piece than this. Uh, there's a pauldron uh, that I have that's gonna be kind of the, the center of the class today. Um, and it has the same, the same kind of thing uh, happening there to it. It's starting to fall apart, starting to come apart. And uh, something that you can do if you have this uh, situation, you can stop it where, at whatever point that it is. Um, and you would do that uh, by uh, putting a little bit of oil on it. And you can polish some of those edges uh, so that they stop fraying and, and uh, put them together. You do this in the process of building something; it does it does keep things a little bit uh, a little bit better. So if we take a look here, we'll find an edge uh, there. So this bottom edge uh, that's going to get a lot of wear back and forth on things, and see how that's starting to fray out. I've got a, a sponge with uh, some oil in it. Uh, we're going to just rub that on, uh, get that on there for the first. Uh, first little bit, the, or the leather's going to say, oh, thank you. I'm a baseball player. I grew up with baseball gloves and, and uh, catcher's mitts and first baseman's mitts. And again, that's a place that is not friendly to uh, leather because it's dirty. Uh, dirty and gets abused and, and uh, getting uh, beat on and everything else. One of the things that you do need to do as you play baseball is maintain that glove and it'll last you for a long time. I still use the same glove I used in high school. Um, uh, but it's just a matter of making sure that you take care of uh, that glove and oil it up. My younger brother would watch me oil my glove, you know, every, every few weeks uh, through a season or anything else, keep it clean, keep it uh, taken care of that way. He'd watch that and he got really into it. He, he'd like oil his glove every day for a little while. They didn't realize he was doing it. And his glove weighed about 18 pounds, you know, by the end of things. So you don't want to do too much uh to get things done there but you want to make sure that you uh, maintain things you can take a slicking tool uh, like this it's the tool nobody knows what is in leather kits um, it's a slicking tool and what that is going to do is if you uh, rub this on the leather um, on that edge where you've had some oil penetrating into it 
um, it's going to start to make that a slicker edge. Um, when it's slick like that, things don't catch on it. It uh, is a lot more comfortable to wear and comfortable to have um, that way. And because of this is re a really flat cut, uh, we're getting the edges done. If you look, you can see uh, that we're starting to polish some of those edges and keep them nice. I'm not pushing hard. I'm just moving quickly and that friction warms it up and, uh, and makes it so that uh, the fibers stick together, it kind of plastifies and sticks together so that you won't have those uh, fibers popping out and giving you a problem uh, there with that. So if you uh, rub that across, now this is an older dry piece of leather. If we get it wet, uh, we can do that. This is done, I've done this with the, with the oil. Uh, this one I actually did just last night and all I used on this was water. I just put some, I just got it, got it damp, ran this across and it got nice and slick again. Uh, so if you can do that and, and get things right, that actually will keep that leather this way. You won't have to do this necessarily again, um, especially if you maintain it with the oil and, and make sure that you keep that oil content up in the leather itself. Any questions? I will take that as a no. Um, so what I'd like to do uh, today as well is uh, take a look at, at doing something. Like I said, I was I was handed this, said, hey, here's this. It's one shoulder and everybody has two shoulders almost. Even if you lost an arm, you have two shoulders probably. Um, and so I'm gonna actually, I'm gonna duplicate this piece and uh, make another one uh, from, from start to finish. We'll, do, we'll use some magic of television today uh, but we're going to uh, start this piece over and uh, make a make a match, make a pair to this one uh, there. If somebody else has this out there, it'd be great. Just mail it to me. I'll be all done. But um, we're going to we're going to make this piece. We're going to match the tooling. We're going to match everything else uh, that we've done. So first thing uh, that you want to do is copy the copy the pattern. I traced this. I have put it on a piece of paper, rolled it around, traced it so that I have a pretty good, pretty good idea of all the curves. Um, everything that it was, I measured it and made sure that I was square in every way uh, there and ended up uh, with a pattern for it uh, that I cut just out of uh, some uh, cereal box, right? Uh, these are, that makes a nice durable pattern for something that you're going to use a few times. Uh, there is, I would imagine I'll probably make another one of these at some point in time. And I just ran these so they're all the same. Uh, they're all, all cut out of a pattern. Uh, so that you've got a pattern for it. Uh, that way, if you mess up one of the pieces, uh, you can go cut another piece out uh, there, and that's a that's a rough thing. Uh, for the tooling, I want to match the tooling uh, that we have on it, so that we've got a matched set. Uh, in order to match that tooling, uh, it's a pretty a pretty standard uh, Celtic knot. Uh, what I've done is I just took some tracing paper and uh, laid it over and just did a rub like you would uh, at the fossil museum, right? I just, uh, I just ran, a, ran a rub so that I had a pretty good idea of sizes, of angles, everything else uh, that was done. And then I traced it, uh, traced it over onto a regular piece of paper uh, so that I have a final copy. One thing I did change uh, is I really like Celtic knots. Um, I like my knots to be closed. I, don't, I didn't like this uh, open here, if you can see it. And so I, I closed that knot on the other side. So there's gonna be a little difference between the two pauldrons. One's a right, one's a left, I guess, at that point in time. So we did uh, pull this pattern over. Um, and so we've got the pattern, we've got everything there. I went ahead and cut everything um, out of some uh, comparable leather uh, there and had that ready to go. Um, after you've got it cut, this is generally what you're gonna end up with. The heavier leather that we require for armor is pretty stiff uh, there. To get this into get this into shape, you're going to need to get it damp, um, get it to get it wet and cased. Um, as I do any tooling and work, because that's an important part of the finish uh, that we have um, in things, is um, you know making sure it's there. Now you could, if you wanted to, take this, build the pattern dye this black, buy black leather, buy pre-dyed black leather, and all you've got to do is cut it out, punch holes in it, and put uh, some Chicago screws in it. 
and you're ready to go with a, with a piece of armor, uh, you can attach it someplace. Uh, it'll take you a whole bunch less time than if you decorate and make it, uh, make it pretty, um, as far as that goes. Um, and that works. If you just need a piece of armor or need, need something like that and want to do that, and that's the level of skill that you're at, that's a great place to start and a great place to be. Um, I like to make things prettier. Um, it's you know kind of the rule of cool, right? Uh, I want to make sure things are uh, are going. Let's see. I just saw a comment. Do -do. And I'm trying to get to the comments. Uh, you can get pre-dyed uh, pre-dyed black leather from uh, from like uh, Tandy or Lonsdale or Weaver. Uh, most leather suppliers will um, will supply that. Um, it's oil tan. It's oil dyed um, leather. And it generally is a little more expensive uh, because they've done one more process to it. They've dyed it. Uh, I personally like veg tan leather. And then you just get a little dye and you can dye it to the extent that you want it. If you want it to be blue, uh, blue black, you can make it a blue black. Um, lately, everything that I've dyed, everything that I've made has been red and black. So, you know, if we want to make something, you know, red and black, if you want to dye it purple, if you want to dye it green, you can dye it really any color that you want to, but you can get that. Uh, just look through, and the uh, the important thing to pay attention to is you're buying that leather. If it's going to be for armor, uh, you do need it in the 12 to 14 ounce range. Uh, 10 to 12 will sometimes get you thick enough, unless you're going to layer it. Um, if you're going to layer it, sew it together, rivet it together, uh, then you can do that uh, out of you know the six to eight ounce leather um, and layer two parts of it together and have it end up thick enough. Uh, but uh, this is that's something that uh, can happen. So let's see. Why am I? Jeez. All right. Am I, am I back now? Is there anybody unmuted that can tell me they're back? Yeah, you're back. Okay, great. All right. So as far as that goes, that's where you can, that's where you can get it. Uh, most suppliers do just pay attention for that thickness uh, of what it is. It is oil tanned. Um, so it'll be tan all the way through. Like if you look at this uh, leather, if we were to cut into this or carve into this at all, it'll be black all the way through. It's actually, it's completely black. All of the leather is black there. When you dye something, unless you're really, really dipping it for a long time and leaving it uh, in that dye for a long time, you're gonna get uh, that first half a millimeter uh, there, which is about all you ever need. Uh, you'll get that first little bit. As far as cutting leather quickly, um, especially the thick stuff, I actually just use a, a utility knife, just a, a craft knife like this. Uh, razor blade. You want to make sure you keep it sharp. Uh, that helps to really move through the leather uh, quite a bit easier. Um, if you do, um, the best thing to sharpen a blade is actually leather, which is kind of ironic. Um, to strop that blade, I've got a little jeweler's rouge in here on top of a piece of uh, veg tan leather. And you can just run your knife back and forth this way in a strop, and uh, it polishes out that edge. Uh, polishes out that edge and it keeps it uh, nice and sharp so that you can move through uh, leather really, really very well and, and get that taken care of. Uh, so if we've got a, a piece of leather, most of the time if you're cutting, uh, you want to keep your angle as low as possible. If you kick your angle up this way and have a really high angle on your blade, you're going to have an opportunity to change that direction. It's going to jump out of the channel if you're cutting with a with a ruler next to it, a straight edge or something, if you raise that knife up, it has a tendency to want to wander up over top of the blade, over, over top of the 
uh, up over top of the uh, ruler, or it can wander out of what you've cut already. If you keep it nice and low, a lower profile like this, it tends to stay where you want it to be. Um, you don't want to put a whole bunch of pressure on it. You want to make sure that you have it uh, nicely done. Uh, you can pull across. If you look there, I barely cut anything uh, there. I didn't put a bunch of pressure on it, anything that way. Just put, a, put one uh, layer there. And then what I'm going to do is come back and put it back in that same channel and cut through that same thing and just make multiple passes. It's death to that leather by a thousand cuts. And this is only this is only eight ounce, six, eight ounce leather, uh, but we cut through that really pretty well. As I cut this uh, piece of the, the, the 12, 14 ounce, that's how I did that. I went through, I made, hey, I, I cut it in, in sections like this. That way I'm following that same curve, that same curve, that same curve. And it really does uh, get it taken care of for you. Uh, for that. So the next thing I will generally do, uh, once I've got a piece cut out, I've got marks made for where I want to punch holes. Um, the next thing I'm going to do before I get this uh, damp or case it, I want to, I want to uh, bevel my edges, uh, bevel my, the edges on things. That's one thing with this original piece that wasn't done uh, as much. Uh, the beveling of the edge, it's actually a, a little tool like this. And if you can see there, it's a round knife, right? So we're gonna cut this and put a round edge on here. So if we leave this square edge, that's gonna catch on things. It's gonna fray up, it's gonna get beaten up, and it's just not gonna look nice as long as when you have a nice rounded edge. Um, a rounded edge is gonna, is gonna do well. Uh, with this, uh, basically you're just gonna put that in the little groove, uh, just the corner of it. And it's really pretty satisfying as you push right along there and make a mess. Uh, push along it, you're gonna get a little little chunk of leather. Uh, you make your own little leather lace that way. It's not very strong um, there, and just and run that run that right off. When I mark things out, I generally use a pen. I'll use a ballpoint pen or a marker. And I don't worry about that, whatever color it's gonna be, even if I'm gonna make it light, uh, because I'm gonna cut that pen mark off uh, there. It's gonna, it's gonna go away as we bevel that edge. And what that has done to the profile of the leather, it's just taken that corner off. So even now, if we don't do anything else to it, it doesn't have that corner to catch on anymore uh, with anything that's happening. Uh, so if we bevel around the backside, And nice and rounded. Most of the time, you're going to want to turn it over and bevel the other side. This gets us half of it done, especially if it's a if it's a thicker piece. If we turn to the turn the back side. We've still got that square edge, and especially with the flesh side of the leather, it's got even better propensity. It doesn't have that top grain to hold it together. Um, on the flesh side, it does have the tendency to to rip and, and uh, tear and things. This gives us a little bit of an opportunity uh, to have that out of the way and give it uh, a good bevel to not, not give us a problem at a future time. And then we will slick it so that it's not, so it's not good, or so that it's not a, not a problem even better. Now these do need to be polished just like your knife at times, so they do get dull. You can use that same strop uh, to polish it. I've beveled one part of this uh, right along here, and if you put some pressure on it and just drag it backwards two or three times, that's going to polish that back out. And then when you do it again, it will run through that quite a bit better.
So if you ever run into trouble like I had right there on the on this front side, uh, there first thing that you can do is go back and strop the blade. If you ever run into cutting where it's starting to snag in the leather, not cutting well, strop your blade and have it be nice and sharp. That way you've got you've got that taken care of. Now times that you wouldn't bevel both sides is if you are putting two things flat together and you're gonna want this to lay flat and not have that bottom edge to get caught up under something, you want it to be flat and have it be square into something. Uh, you might not uh, bevel that, uh, but for the most part, uh, you'll, you'll generally bevel it that way. So with the beveling done, and the reason I do the beveling without it being damp is a lot of times if it's damp, you've gotta have it really perfect for that, uh, uh, for that uh, beveler to work really well. There are a lot of different bevelers. This is, I think, a number four. Um, you can buy them smaller and bigger. Uh, you can get them all the way up to uh, a French beveler uh, that actually is pretty wide. It's almost the skiving knife um, that way. It does really well if you're really trying to take some, some edge off of things. You can do uh, really what you want to. It's just almost like a sharp little chisel there as it goes, but it does, you do have different sizes for different things. If you're working with really thin leather, they like the number one beveler is a little, little tiny guy. It's a, a very, very small half a millimeter uh, across on that cutting edge and really takes a, a very fine amount, uh, fine amount out of your way and off of that. But of course, a smaller piece of leather is going to be a smaller amount there. So I'm going to actually really quick case this and then we're going to talk about putting, uh, putting things in on and uh, going forward. So I'll be right back. So I just ran this under, under uh, cool water uh, for just a, a minute or two. I just got the whole thing wet. It's not completely saturated all the way through. In fact, we'll be able to watch it start to dry out a little bit. Um, there you can see some of this pork house stretch marks. Uh, there, one thing that I've noticed is as you get into the thicker leathers, they are much more of a utility <clears throat> and they don't have uh, as great a grain. They're not as high quality. Uh, they're most of the time for armor. It's not going to be super pretty, anything, uh, anything really, really uh, super nice. If you want something super nice, sew two layers together. Uh, buy a nicer, buy a nicer cut in a six or eight ounce. Uh, that'll be a little bit cheaper because to get something super thick, super nice, there's not a lot of call for it. Uh, so it does become very expensive. Uh, so you can see that the colors changed. Our flexibility has changed incredibly uh, just with a, a dunk in water. If you don't work with leather very much, this is something as I started, this was something that was uh, absolutely crazy amazing uh, to me is that, oh, you're not ever supposed to get leather wet, right? Uh, but with this, uh, you do. Now in my process, I usually try, once I've cased the leather or gotten it wet like this, I try to not let it dry out until I'm finished and I'm, I'm letting dye dry. Um, mainly because if you do let it dry out and wet it again and dry out and wet it again, you're actually doing what you're not supposed to do with leather and why you don't usually get things wet uh, with leather and you're, you're drying that out, you're getting things in. Um, if you happen to do that, if you have, get away from a project and it dries out, uh, put some oil on it. Uh, take some of the Neat's Foot oil and, and uh, rub it down with it so that it has, it has some oil and some, uh, some happiness uh, there with it. Uh, there, at this point in time, you take your, uh, take your pattern, what you want to, uh, uh, put on, uh, put on as far as the decoration of any kind. And this is kind of another cool, cool leather property. If you're doing something big, you can take uh, something to hold it down and make sure that it stays in place. This is small enough. I'm just going to use my hand. It's kind of like pinning when you're sewing or not pinning when you're sewing. Uh, there, this spot is actually the center of the top. So I can kind of line that up uh, with the center that's here. 
uh, bring it back from the center there and have it where I want it. And then I'm just actually gonna draw on top of the paper, uh, the knot as we go. And this is a quiet, boring experience. It's pretty satisfying if you like to sit and draw. These are fun things to experiment with and draw out. So I'm just using a stylus. I'm not pushing very hard. doesn't have to be an absolutely perfect copy because we're going to actually draw it again with a knife. If you do really big ones, you can kind of go cross-eyed sometimes. Forget where you're at. If not cross where they're not supposed to cross. Be on top when it's supposed to be on the bottom. Bottom one's supposed to be on the top. But we've got that fairly well drawn. Uh, for doing it uh, by hand, live, etc. Any questions as we go? So we're going to do some cutting again. So again, we're going to come back to the strop. This is a swivel knife. It's an intimidating little thing that uh, comes when you get a leather kit, so a leather tooling kit or anything else. And it's not intended to cut all the way through the leather. So if you look at the profile of the blade, it is a very thick, wide uh, blade that comes to a point. Uh, so the geometry of it actually helps open the leather up so that you can, uh, opens the leather up so that you can actually uh, tool around it and have that uh, there. You still want, even though it looks like it's super sharp and everything's really good, if I do this much tooling uh, there, I wanna, strop that blade just a little bit just to make sure that uh, we've got a nice smooth blade and that helps us keep a nice uh, smooth cut uh, as we go. And then uh, you can just start cutting. And of course I'm right-handed and the camera's on that side. But you can plug that in there. And cut, I try to go in the same direction just to save time and picking the piece up and such. Try to cut in the same direction. But it's the knife blade swivels really well so you can make those curves and turns really good. If you're coming to where things cross, like here we're gonna have this crossover, don't go all the way to the next one until you have that one cut because when you start that you're going to want to put the corner of the blade in there uh, in the in the old groove or in the in the last cut uh, to actually come up, come out and come across so we'll put that in that spot and and bring it out from there rather than cutting into it if you would come the other way you have the chance of cutting into this section. And once leather is cut, you can do some things to kind of squish it back together. But kind of like after you bend a piece of metal, you're gonna to have to work really, really hard 
and it may not ever be flat again. Or if you crumple a piece of paper up, you're probably not ever going to get that piece of paper uh, nice and flat again. Uh, so I usually try to make sure as I'm uh, tooling anything like this uh, that we come into those come into those corners the same way. I'm not used to talking while I'm tooling, so uh, that's different. What you do is actually continue to tool that, uh, cut that out all the way around. Uh, but we'll take a little bit at some tool, take a little look at some tooling. If your volume is turned up, you might want to turn it down because we're going to uh, do a little bit of beveling. So this is a beveler. It's uh, just an angled, an angled piece. So if it drives straight down, it's going to push more here than it pushes there, and it's just going to make it look like there's two layers. Because here, this is still too kind of kind of two dimensional. Uh, we want to make it a lot more three dimensional. Um, so you start on the one end and you're going to uh, have the tool kind of rest uh, on the on the piece, uh, but you're going to be pulling back up a little bit. You're going to use your fingers uh, kind of as a spring and tool along with lots of short So we can see with that little bit, uh, we came out uh, to make a difference between the two. We've got a little bit of a, we've got a bevel moving down towards this. So this, the design is going to stand up. And we go in little tiny uh, short things. You see people, um, I've seen things that have been tooled that it almost looks like somebody's gone this way and said, okay, hey, I'm going to have one hit per tool and move that tool all the way across because it's a big tool. But you can see those tooling marks and how it's uh, bigger in the middle. Uh, so it does work much, much better to move that tool just a millimeter, two millimeters at a time, just a little bit so that you're getting each bit over and over with, with a place. And that makes a lot smoother tooling. You can then go back and actually smooth that tooling out. Uh, with the tool itself and get that taken care of. Another thing that we want to do as a feature of this is uh, we want to make it look like the knots that are the, the lines that are underneath are actually going underneath. So you'd bevel those as well. So we bevel that right to that corner. We can come in here. that again actually that's not cut Oops. it's always interesting when you find something that you didn't cut as you were going get that cut in and if you can keep things keep having from, from having to move the piece again and again Uh, you can be a lot more efficient with it because this does take time. So when somebody says, oh, this is how much this piece of uh, armor would cost, or this is how much this would cost, this is the time that gets uh, spent in there. It's not just the cost of the leather in a lot of ways. That's why you add on to that cost of leather. So now we have, if we look, uh, we've got a nicely tooled uh, little area right here. Follows right in here. Um, and we want to uh, make that as, as nice as we can. The outside is going to be just smooth. That's how the other one's tooled. Uh, the inside one has actually got some texture to it. Um, I personally like a really smooth uh, beveling, uh, but uh, there's a lot of people out there that will use a texture. And so you have, uh, there are bevelers that are textured. Uh, this particular texture is a, is a little bigger texture. Uh, so we've got a matting or a backgrounding tool. Uh, that's got this, and they also make the beveler with that same uh, pattern on it. Uh, so you've got a large and small. Uh, your small tool uh, really gets used in these small corners and small spaces. What you want to try to do is not necessarily be able to see that it was a tool that did this. 
So you'll change directions and uh, get things background then. And get those corners done. So now we have a piece that's backgrounded. Um, once we have the bevel there, all the way around and through all of these, it'll have that, uh, it'll look like it's a different piece or a different part of that leather. So now through the magic of television, I'm gonna try not to, uh, try not to break your ears because I'm hitting something with a hammer right next to a microphone, which y'all are listening to. Uh, so these pieces I did actually last night, um, and I've kept them in just a plastic bag. I didn't seal it up tight. It doesn't need to be a Ziploc. And as you can see, they're still damp. Uh, these are actually right, right in the spot to tool um, as we go. And so if we look at this one, it's in a spot uh, that I finished doing all the beveling. Uh, there, there's a little bit of finished beveling to do. Uh, as if you can see in these corners, these corners need to be cleaned up just a little bit if we want to make it uh, make it look really nice and, and uh, really good. We want to clean those corners up. We want to make sure that these two pieces don't blend together. Like I said, if you accidentally cut, you can actually blend things together if you pound on it a little bit and smash that leather back together. Because these cuts used to come all the way to this line, uh, but it actually uh, is not there uh, anymore. It's actually, I've, I filled that line in when I beveled. Uh, there and that actually happens quite a bit when you bevel. When I uh, get to this point, generally, um, I will go back with a smaller beveler. Uh, there, it's the same angle, uh, same as the other smooth beveler, uh, but it's just a little bit smaller. I'll come back into those. For example, this one that's uh, kind of closed up. clean around that. We look right here, clean around that to make it, make sure that this stays its own, its own entity. We've got this that's gonna be in the background and this that's there. With the background shading, it doesn't matter as much. Uh, there is a way come across and say, all right, hey, let's, let's do this one that has some of the same problem. And we take the background shader and say, here we go. It's the magic of background shading. Suddenly many of your mistakes and errors are very well hidden uh, by that background shader. So if we look here, we were able to accomplish the same thing just much faster. I truly believe this is why everybody uses the background shading is because they're all lazy and they don't wanna clean up all those little corners uh, there. So if you're gonna have it smooth, uh, then you're gonna need want to clean up those corners and do some things. If you're gonna have it uh, backgrounded like this is on the inside, uh, then all you need to worry about are the outside corners uh, and keeping those clean. Uh, coming back through uh, with the modeling spoon, uh, really helps clean this up. If we look really close right here, you can see that as we beveled, it pushed a little bit of this up. Right here, it pushed a little of this edge up. So it's got kind of a lip uh, over the edge of that. And again, that's something that'll get caught on things. Um, and it just, it doesn't look even, it doesn't look the same. So I just come back through with the uh, modeling spoon, put a little bit of pressure on it and you actually burnish it just a little bit because you're uh, causing some heat and friction. And you can do some kind of cool things with it and in shaping things and modeling that uh, to, to be bigger uh, or to, to look different, have a little bit of, a little bit of shape in, it, in itself. Not necessarily beveled, but kind of beveled uh, there as we go. So as we clean that up, 
that does uh, clean up your tooling quite a bit and help that to be uh, nice and smooth, especially anything that's pointy like this. Uh, we want to make sure that that's kind of compacted together so it doesn't fall apart. So we've got, uh, so it's not getting caught on something later and, and torn off. So now we can see that in this outside edge that we've uh, done, that makes that just nice and smooth and round, if that makes sense. Any questions on this this far in tooling? See no comments. All right. So all right. So as we've got that, uh, that gets us done and through the magic of television again, and to keep you from having to listen to the pounding, uh, we've got this one that is uh, fairly well finished. We got uh, edges pretty well uh, knocked down. It could possibly use a little bit more uh, TLC and happiness in a few places uh, there and that you, you'll always see afterwards, just like doing anything else that's detailed. Uh, but this is pretty well ready to be dyed. Uh, before we dye, we wanna uh, put our holes in it. Uh, these are Chicago screws. Um, so we will use a rotary hole punch and get those ready for Chicago screws. I got the, um, uh, this is a, a compounded uh, one and I absolutely love it. I've had a regular one for a long time and with the uh, heavy leathers, it uh, was frustrating uh, to try and punch through. And I, a lot of times, even for edge pieces like this, I would use a drill uh, because you can use a drill especially with the thick leather. Just make sure you back it with something. Uh, but you can uh, very easily uh, do things. That is not a Chicago screw. So a lot of times as you're patterning and marking what you want things to be, always remember you can make a hole bigger, but you can't make a hole any smaller. So that's gonna be a regular rivet. there and so sometimes as you're marking holes it's a good idea to mark them differently to remind yourself that hey this is going to be something different uh, than what it is this is going to be a regular rivet just for a retaining strap and all of our other holes are going to be uh, put in like for a shoulder strap or anything else I'll put those in as as needed uh, just over the finished product. So we've got our holes made, um, everything ready to go. This is ready to take care of our edges and uh, do some dyeing. Um, whenever you dye, you wanna make sure that you wear rubber gloves. Remember you're made of leather too, and leather dye is intended to dye leather. And so if you're made of leather, we don't want you dyed. So it's a good idea to wear, wear some gloves. I'm super cheap, so I use gloves until they break and or something else happens to them. A lot of times I'll get a little pinhole in a finger and after I've been dying things for a little while, uh, suddenly I'll have a, a finger uh, that is all black and all the rest of my hands clean. So I've been dying there. Um, as you're tooling, in case you're new to leather working, they always talk about your marble slabs or things like that. Um, this is just a chunk of marble. It's actually a chunk of uh, granite off of a plant stand. It's just a table uh, that I had. You can get them. Uh, they're a little tiny slab like this. Uh, will cost you $25, $30. Uh, there is, you buy it from a leather supply company. This cost me nothing. It's a plant stand we were gonna throw away uh, because the table was all dinged up and, and uh, actually fell over I think broke uh, which caused this little chip uh, but that works if you're looking for another place for it uh, you can get them at like a a granite countertop place what they cut the sink the sink cutouts they usually give those away and that is actually the perfect size uh, for that it's not too heavy it's not too big you can get it in and out of your way 
and uh, works really well. I'm a really careful buyer. I don't get very much in the wrong place, but you always want to protect your work surface and uh, keep dye from being where it's not supposed to be. Um, I use for the edges on something like this. This is the, the lower one. So I'm going to use another little edge treatment uh, involved in this as well, uh, because it's going to get some of the most abuse uh, that happens. But uh, we're going to use uh, black. I actually really like the water stain. Uh, the, it's the EcoFlow water stain. It works really, really well. I haven't had it really come off very much, um, especially if you put a top coat on it. Um, it stays really, really well. It cleans up with water. It doesn't smell bad. I'm all stained here in my, in my uh, workshop inside my house, and my wife doesn't complain about it like she does when I'm making something with contact cement. Um, that the, you know, hey, the whole house stinks. What are we getting high? What's the deal? Um, but this and this comes in a whole bunch of different colors: uh, green and red and black and blue and uh, purple. Uh, it, they have metallic additives that you can put in with it. Uh, they've got gold and silver, as well as a pearl. Uh, when you put the gold with something, it does act as a yellow. So you want to make sure as you're mixing stains, these do mix really well. If you're mixing stains. You want to make sure that you're paying attention to what it's actually going to be uh, in the end. So you'll know, shake that, uh, shake that up, and have some. I apply almost everything with a sponge. If we're doing something really careful, we'll use a dauber or a brush. Uh, but it's a good idea uh, to run that that way. For this edge, I've got this all beveled and uh, happy and ready to go. I think I missed one edge. Um, in fact, I did. And this is why I don't bevel when it's uh, when it's damp, because it is just super mushy. If we look there, it just comes out as a little bit of goo and mush. But we want that shape uh, there. We're going to put some dye on uh, because this is going to be all black. I don't care where it's going. Or what's happening with it? Um, we, we are just paying attention. Jump in and say that we have ten minutes into our ten minutes. Yep. Clocks, just so you know. Yep. I just I actually just saw that my clock just went off. Thank okay. you. Sweet. So we're gonna put that put that in there, and and have some black uh, that way, because this is the bottom edge. It's gonna receive a little more abuse. I'm gonna use some gum tragacanth. Uh, there, it's. I've liked it better than wax, better than anything else uh, that there is, um, for a really, really well finished edge and an edge that's going to hold together. It puts a little bit of, a little bit of plastic, I think, in the thing. I don't know all of the chemistry of it, uh, but if we look there, that's how that's going to look beforehand. We're going to run the slicker on it. I'm not putting huge amounts of pressure on it. I'm going to switch kind of back and forth between uh, the second slot and the first slot uh, to be able to get all of that edge uh, taken care of. You don't want to push too hard. Uh, then you can use the other flat edge uh, there to really get the things taken care of. And if we look at that at the end, we have a nice slick, super shiny so rubber glove. If you're rubbing it on regular leather, you get a lot of friction and catch here. You hardly hear it. It uh, really just it runs really, really smooth. Uh, so that works out. As you're putting your dye on, depending on the type of finish that you're doing, you do want to uh, take off any take off excess. You don't want some pulling up because that's going to give you some uneven dye. Uh, there and I got a little overzealous with what we uh, put on there in the first place. I'm going to really quick dye the majority of this and we'll come back to that of those other edges in another moment. We're going to dye the majority of this, let that seep in a little bit, and then we're going to wipe off some of our excess. I'm not letting that quite sit long enough, so we a 
we didn't, but we can uh, run that run that off and make sure that we uh, get a, get enough dye in. We didn't get quite enough in here, and that's mostly mostly because we're pulling this off, just trying to get and get finished uh, with this. Another thing that you can use that I will put on here at this point in time because it's usually uh, next to finished coat. It's going to be a gel antique. Um, in fact, I will see what it see what it does. A little tiny bit of this goes an awfully long way. As far as the uh, antique goes, you can put it on and then use a sponge to move it around. And it stays fairly wet. The neat thing about it is it's a gel gets down in all the little cracks and crevices because leather is super imperfect. Um, really doesn't have, uh, it's not as smooth as it actually looks. Gets down in all the little cracks and crevices everywhere. Uh, push it in, rub it in, especially in your tooling. And that work uh, that happens there. Once you get it on again, you can just actually wipe it off. You're going to actually be leaving some of it in your deepest crevices. So you can see that it's still shiny and, and wet in the edges of that tooling. And we kind of want to leave that that way, uh, at least for another minute or two. Get that taken care of that way, buff that out. And actually, we can't even see that we missed some of this dye right here. It actually looks really pretty good uh, there. So that. I don't know if the camera can pick it up or not, but the difference between this and, a, and just a minute ago with just the black dye is amazing. Um, there, this just puts a lot of depth in that color, makes it look really nice. They make this in browns, they make it in uh, like a cordovan uh, for your reds, uh, red colors and things as well as the black. And it just really uh, puts, that, uh, puts that finish to it. Uh, the last part of finish is gonna be a sheen or a top coat uh, that you'd have. Uh, this is satin, uh, so it's a satin finish, uh, really kind of a flat. Everything I do is generally shiny. Uh, I did one flat thing here a little while ago for somebody, so I got a little thing of flat, um, but I usually, uh, with a lot of your finished stuff, uh, it's going to go there. This is almost as, as uh, viscous and, and uh, thin as milk. Um, it is really, really thin. Uh, so as you put it on, you want to put it on with a with a sponge and move it around to make sure that you're that you're getting it in. This will waterproof uh, the leather, um, so you want to make sure that all of your forming is done uh, beforehand, um, and get that get that taken care of before you really get into a lot of a uh, lot of finish. Does anybody have any questions on what we've done? We've we've nearly finished this. Next thing you'd do would be just to form it and you'd want to still form it while it's wet. And all of a sudden we have this same thing that we had before. Do you do any oiling during your building process? I generally do. Um, I'll generally oil a little bit. I oiled this leather last night uh, before I uh, before I got started with it. I don't know why my camera went away. Um, I do, I'll, I'll oil uh, throughout the process just to keep things uh, damp, especially straps. Uh, your straps, you wanna make sure that you've got uh, quite a bit of oil in them, um, especially before you put that top coat on and put that finish coat on uh, there because that kind of locks things in. Uh, there through time, that top coat's gonna get worn a little bit and you'll be able to get oil back through it. Uh, but at the beginning, uh, that oil is uh, is important through that process. And I actually skipped that as we were doing this. I usually do oil. Darn clock. I haven't done uh, much with wax hardening. I have done water hardening. Um, there, I've I've watched a lot on wax hardening as as I was trying to decide, hey, what am I going to do? How am I going to how am I going to uh, Harden things, what do I want to have? And the wax hardening is a little more of a process. You've got to heat that wax up. You've got to have a place to uh, heat it, things like that. And I just haven't, 
uh, haven't necessarily done that. So we can continue over in the uh, in the Discord, and we'll see everybody there. Thank you all. Yay! Yay! Thank you. Yay. Thank you, Fuego. Um, Thanks. Thanks, Fuegos. You betcha. Yay! Thank you, Fuegos. Cool. So we have joining in Alina's uh, class in two minutes about how to make a Gandalf satchel. Um, if, yes, I can. <laughs> yep. If you're not here for that, you can leave while staying on the exact same channel and a Zoom link for all of our classes. So you can come and go as you desire. Um, as Lynn just said, we can continue the conversation about leather on the Chaos World Discord. And he shared a link to that in the chat. So if you want to ask Fuego's questions, you can direct them there, or you can find him on Facebook, I'm sure. We also have a plethora of other leather workers on our Discord that would be able to answer your questions if you post them. And then Alina, I need to get set up so I can share your screen um for the beginning of the recording so it has that timestamp.